Do you ever feel like you're living in the early chapters of a science fiction novel? Technology is overthrowing old assumptions about how the world works and what it means to be human. But if life is changing too fast for your comfort, I'm afraid I have some bad news. In March of next year, Pluto will begin a 20-year stay in the sign of Aquarius. Pluto in Aquarius has coincided with some of the most revolutionary moments in history. It's about dramatic shifts in perspective and new structures that reshape human societies. The revolution is about to begin. This is the last episode of this series on the astrology of the 2020s. And once again, I'm joined by SJ Anderson. Pluto will clarify and crystallize the core of what new technological changes want to do to humanity and to society and to culture. That's how I see Pluto and Aquarius. It's an opportunity to transform humanity itself. There's a real challenge, I think, over the next period against these technological changes to figure out what it actually is to be human. In this video, we're gonna dive deep into the history and symbolism of Pluto in Aquarius. We're gonna consider the context and age of air. And we're gonna consider what this transit might mean for our changing sci-fi world. First of all, let's delve into the meaning of the dwarf planet Pluto, a character we haven't really met yet in this story. Pluto is a fascinating planetary point in astrology because it was the discovery of Pluto in 1930 that introduced astronomers to this idea of the Kuiper Belt. It was the first object in the Kuiper Belt, which is the belt beyond Neptune. And so we have the trans-Neptunians that come into play. These are small objects. This becomes a huge theme of Pluto, something very small that contains great power, that has great impact. When we examine the discovery of a planet, we like to look around in the world what was happening. The 1930s include things like the rise of fascism, something that has great power, like a, the seed of an idea that can then take over a society. Think about nuclear weapons, the first test of a nuclear bomb at the Trinity site in New Mexico in 1945, using science that was developed during the discovery of Pluto. You're looking at these tiny atoms and then there's the collisions that are triggered to create these massive explosions, the greatest explosions humanity's seen with a nuclear bomb or an atomic bomb. That's Pluto. It's the tiny unseen showing itself in ways that are so powerful. Pluto was the Greek god of the underworld. He was also known as Hades. And in astrology, transits from Pluto, when Pluto hits important points in our natal chart, can feel like a journey to the underworld, one that we emerge from forever changed. And so there's a death component to Pluto that's very much a part of its significations. Death, and therefore the, the life that comes as a result of dying. You might think about it as a snake shedding its skin, where there's a transformation in appearance, or even better, a caterpillar into, into a chrysalis, into a butterfly. This is why I think the transformative potential of Pluto is the side that I personally want to focus on, because Pluto is taking us somewhere. It's removing for the purpose of rebirthing. So Pluto comes between the Great Wars. The Great War killed a whole generation, the lost generations of Europe that were slaughtered in the 19 teens. And Pluto then emerges and is discovered. Death is on the mind. Death is front and center in the collective conscious and unconscious at the time of Pluto's discovery. And then it propels Europe and the globe into a second world war. Pluto can sneak up on you. My sense of it, and I describe it often, is the thing that is the essential feature of something that we ignore or we don't give proper attention to. And because of it being so essential, it eventually will make itself known and become sort of the core of the moment. It will become the true nature of the factual transaction. What about the sign of Aquarius? This is a sign traditionally ruled by Saturn and which modern astrologers give to Uranus. The sign of Aquarius, the zodiac sign of Aquarius, one of the most misunderstood signs, I think. Partially because in the contemporary scene and really the late 20th century scene, Aquarius sometimes gets uh, confused with Uranus because of modern rulership theory, which 
I'm not against, I'm not an astrologer that's against any theory. A lot of astrologers run wild with their imaginations and their connections, it's my philosophy. But it becomes a little bit more focused in the 20th century, particularly second half on the Uranian, the idea of the breakthroughs, that this is what the Aquarian is. And I think what was lost with Aquarius was the side of Saturn being the traditional ruler and how much Aquarius encompasses themes of Saturn. So when, do, when exploring Aquarius, for me, that's the first place I want to go to understand Aquarius. What is Saturn? What does it do? We can turn to Vedius Valens, the earliest and maybe clearest and cleanest uh, explication of the significations of the planets. He just lists the keywords. He says that it's malignant, solitary, secretive in their trickery, humblings, imprisonments, chains, griefs. Um, he talks about being renters of property, tax farmers. You know, these aren't the most glamorous things when we think about Saturn. Now, that's not all Saturn is. There's also a whole nother side according to Valens, where Saturn can bring what he calls great ranks, distinguished positions, supervisions, management of others' property. And so it's kind of like the owners versus the masses of the owned is what Saturn is keying us into, the hierarchies of dominance in a society. In episode two of this series, we saw how Saturn was traditionally associated with water side trades because bodies of water tended to serve as boundaries of states and of the known world. So if the sun is at the center of things, then Saturn patrols the edges of known reality, defining its limits, plotting against the sun, scheming to overthrow that which stands at the center. This is reflected in the zodiac through Aquarius's position opposite the sun sign of Leo. And this is crucial to the revolutionary associations of Aquarius. And we see these most clearly when transformational Pluto transits through that sign. So when we understand the sign of the zodiac, like I said, I love focusing on planets. And this is where we come into some of the ancient uh, theory of rulership. I think about planetary rulers as simply planets that are assigned dominion over a sign. And we have various ways to do it. It's not just the major form of rulership called domicile rulership. We have exaltation rulership. We have triplicity rulers. Those are the major forms of rulership where a planet is assigned rulership over every degree of a sign. So I like to focus just on those three when I dig into the meaning of a sign. So in the case of Aquarius, we do not have an exaltation ruler. And then when it comes to triplicity rulers of the two major ones that actually get assigned dominion, one will be assigned at night, one will be assigned at day. Um, there's a third ruler that I discard for purposes of this analysis. but. Those two rulers are Saturn, so we have a double dose of Saturn now, but their only other planet that has this dominion over Aquarius is Mercury. So we've looked at Saturn, and if there's one thing I can say to anybody out there, when you think about Aquarius or air signs, you have to include Mercury. So let's turn to Mercury now. What can Mercury tell us about the Aquarian archetype? Let's go back to Mr. Valens. Mercury is education, okay? It's markets. It is youth and games. It is discoveries. It is testing of coinage. So we've got a lot of money here. Forethought in intelligence, the creator of all marketing and banking, doctors, prophets, diviners, uh, systematic physicians, displays of skill, deception, gambling, or sleight of hand, and then all coins used in buying and selling. And so the keys, when we wanna to try to then bring in the mercurial for Aquarius, we're talking about innovation, the mind, the beauty of intelligence, medical breakthroughs and discoveries, the power of the mind to organize data and then use that and exploit that in innovative ways to discover new technologies. Um, Aquarius is an air sign. What is the element of air? It's things that we can't see. It's things that, that get projected through the air like sound. And so when you combine all of this together, my favorite phrase for Aquarius, would be a sign that tends to want to implement novel order, wanting to go out into this society, use the ingenuity of Mercury, the breakthroughs of Mercury, the excitement, the youth, the energy of Mercury, uh, combine that with a Saturnine desire to want to impose those breakthroughs on others and reform and change and alter society in a way, you know, kind of for the benefit of this new novel vision. Now, Pluto takes about a quarter of a millennium to orbit the Sun, and it spends a bit more than 20 of those years in the sign of Aquarius. And what we see when Pluto's in Aquarius is the overthrow 
of the center by those on the margins. We see titanic forces held underground emerging to transform systems and structures. And so without Pluto there, maybe it doesn't hit quite as deeply to sort of these core issues or these fundamental components of what makes up the self, the collective, and the reality. Pluto will force the Aquarian changes to dig as deeply as possible and to be as profoundly uh, impactful as they're able to be. But what we also need to bear in mind is the context in which this Pluto transit through Aquarius is taking place. This is an age of air. Now, if you don't know what I mean by that, I have a video all about this subject, which I'd suggest you watch after this series if you haven't already, but we'll try and get you up to speed here. These elemental ages, ages of fire, earth, air, water, are based on the conjunctions of Jupiter and Saturn. So in our current moment, we've transitioned from an age of Earth into now an age of air where Jupiter and Saturn will be conjoining in air signs continuously now, starting on the winter solstice in 2020 until 2159 when they conjoin in Scorpio. Now, ages of air are periods of great intellectual and educational advances, plagues, and the dissolution of old structures built in the prosperous ages of Earth that precede them. In other words, the context of Pluto in Aquarius is that these are already airy times. This is an age of information. If you're enjoying this video and this channel, please do us a massive favor and give it a like and subscribe if you're not already subscribed right now. Please, just there. Thanks. Now we've done that symbolic work, let's dive into the history of Pluto transits through Aquarius. And what we're gonna see is that these are revolutionary periods and completely new ways of seeing the world replace old ones. So the first of these periods takes us all the way back to the medieval era from February 1286 to 1308. The interesting thing about this transit of Pluto through Aquarius is that just like in the 2020s, it was also an age of air. It had begun a century earlier in 1186 and would last until 1425. And this age of air was a period of huge intellectual advances. It was a period when universities spread all over Europe. It was an educational golden age. And in 1184, just a couple of years before that first air conjunction, the Catholic Church set up the medieval Inquisition. It wanted to suppress heretic Christian sects like the Cathars and the Waldensians. Think about our current preoccupation with questions around censorship and misinformation in the internet age. There's a clear thematic resonance here. And this was also the era of the Mongols. You can think about the Mongol Empire as an age of air, an elemental age of air empire. They revived the Silk Road. There was new trade routes that extended over large swaths of the world, all the way from China into Europe. Goods were exchanged that had never been exchanged before. And it was all under the protection of the Mongols. It was a new order. And so this is a fascinating period to look at for what we may be going into. We even have the Belt and Road Initiative that China has been working on for a while to revive the Silk Road yet again during this period. The Mongols also conquered China during this age of air, and they were now ruling it as the Yuan Dynasty. This was unprecedented and difficult for the Chinese establishment because China was being ruled by outsiders. Now, while Pluto was in Aquarius, someone you might have heard of visited China, Marco Polo, the famous Venetian merchant and explorer. Now, Marco Polo returned to Europe in 1296, and he published his book, the Travels of Marco Polo. This book did so much to fire up European imaginations about the East. Think about how important that was. He's in the courts in Venice saying, look at all these things I discovered from China, all of the breakthroughs and the revelations and the new visions and the technological upgrades, all of these Aquarian themes. And it would inspire other explorers such as Christopher Columbus. And that would have huge consequences for the world. Now we're going to move forward to the next time Pluto was in Aquarius, 1532 to 1553. Next period we're going to look at is interesting. Pluto's in Aquarius in the 16th century. It's another example where we can filter transits based on other features. We just add another layer to a transit 
based on what's happening now to try to get a little bit more focus with what may be arriving based on what happened in the past. In this case, we get a, another elegant overlay, which is Neptune and Aries with Pluto and Aquarius, which we're about to enter into right mid-decade here in the 2020s. The fascinating thing, remember Neptune and Aries just briefly, it's religions, new boundaries and borders, all of those things we talked about in episode two of this series. So you kind of combine some of that here. You'll see these themes highly emergent during this period. It's the maybe height of the Protestant Reformation, where the Protestant Reformation is spreading all over Europe. This was essentially a rebellion against the Roman Catholic Church. It led to the creation of a new form of Christianity, Protestantism, which rejected the authority of Rome. And in some places, such as England, it led to massive systemic changes. King Henry VIII, he of the Six Wives, famously broke with Rome and made himself head of the Church of England at this time. In other words, this was a rebellion against Rome, against the center, and it led to the formation of a new center on a cold, wet island on the edges of Europe. And then there's the response to that, right? The Saturnine order had to refresh itself, the old order, in response to the Reformation rising. And so the Catholic Church and founds the Jesuits. That order gets founded. The Roman Inquisition begins during this period, 1542. So that's this competition for who can be Saturn, who gets to impose the rules, who gets to control the hierarchies. And incredibly, at the same time as all of this was happening in South America, the ruthless conquistador Francisco Pizarro was conquering Peru. In November 1532, he captured the Inca emperor Atahualpa, and the next year, executed him. In 1535, he founded Lima. And we can see, once again, these themes of Pluto in Aquarius. A stranger arrives from the sea, and the center is overthrown. Now let's fast forward again to Pluto's next transit through Aquarius from April 1777 to December 1798, the end of the Enlightenment. This is perhaps the most famously revolutionary period in history. It's in this period that we see the American Revolution, the French Revolution, the Haitian Revolution against slavery. Right as America is born as a new nation, so you have Aquarian themes of freedom, you know, resisting the Saturnine hierarchies, themes of Mercury and new ideas and fresh discoveries in terms of the articulation of, you know, liberal governance structures that you also see in the French Revolution and some of their manifestos and their, you know, explications of what freedom means. You know, it's very innovative and new. And there's another event at this time of huge importance and relevance to our present day. It took place on the 4th of September, 1793. This was the McCartney Embassy. This was the first formal meeting between the British Empire, represented by a colonial official, George McCartney, and China then under the rule of the Qing dynasty. The British were seeking concessions from China that would further their imperial and trading ambitions. The Chinese Qianlong Emperor refused McCartney, but this encounter would eventually lead to China's humiliation by the British and other European colonial powers. China had seen itself as Zhongguo, the Middle Kingdom, the center of the world. But at this time, with Pluto in Aquarius, it discovered that there were powerful outsiders coming from across the sea. Think of the great rivalry of our current times, United States, which you could see as a successor state to Britain and China. So now let's turn to our current time and think about what this coming transit might mean for our world. We're gonna try and transplant these Aquarian themes that we've seen in the history into our sci-fi present day. The dates, Pluto enters Aquarius the first time, 23 March, 2023. Pluto then will regress into Capricorn in June on the 11th in 2023. Pluto re-enters Aquarius 21 January, 2024, sneaks back into Capricorn just at the end of 2024, 2nd September, and then on the 19th of November, it will enter, that's in 2024, it will enter Aquarius for the last time for good this cycle. And so from 19 November, 2024, that's when we are living fully into this new Pluto and Aquarius reality, no more transition phase. We're lucky in a way, because it's not pure guesswork with what this Aquarian turn may be offering us. We've lived through, starting in March, 2020, Saturn's time in Aquarius that will also end in March, 2023, Saturn will enter Pisces for good. And we had Jupiter with Saturn 
in Aquarius for much of 2021. They were there together. So we've had a heavy helping of Aquarius that can show us and maybe teach us what could be coming, what will be built upon, you might say. So let's think about 2020, what happened? What can we kind of objectively say emerged that's Aquarian? Technology is taking on a more powerful role. Everybody's on Zoom, so we've seen the internet become more important, the internet technology become more important. The biotech side of Aquarius, remember Mercury is systematic physicians and doctors and innovative discoveries. I've used the phrase medicalization with Aquarius because it is this kind of mercurial medical way that we view our reality and view life through. And then the ordering of that through uh, hierarchies of authority, well, that pretty much describes the pandemic problems, right? It's the question of how is authority deployed to protect health and safety. Now we saw how the question of management of information, of misinformation and disinformation became hugely important. And that theme has really continued and expanded during the Ukraine war. We're trying to figure out the balance between what individuals want and what's good for the collective. Pluto will distill even more to like a kernel of what the true nature of techn these technologies are vis-a-vis -vis our humanity. You know, the digitization of money through the central bank digital currencies, blockchain, everything's online, all spending is on a public ledger. Governments on the cusp of being able to program away certain expenditures if they deem those expenditures unsafe. One that's very Aquarian and I think emblematic of these themes is the digital ID concept, but a biometric digital ID. So you have a digital card that has a, some kind of chip that only gets activated with a thumbprint or with an iris scan or with a drop of blood, very Gattaca. This is coming on board. There's stories this year, Canada doing a biometric digital ID. They're out ahead to implement this technology. Of course, the example of this that's maybe the most egregious is the Chinese social credit model, particularly when combined with some of the COVID policies. I saw news this week that whole groups of protesters had their QR code for COVID um, turned red, that they weren't safe. And so you can see this kind of overlap between medical technological innovation and how that then gets combined with political and maybe more authoritarian technological innovation. And they can sort of bleed over into each other. One of the biggest technological breakthroughs is AI. You have the news that came out this week. Meta's AI just had a breakthrough where it was able to defeat human players in a diplomacy game. So this is not strictly something like Go or chess with rules of moving pieces that AIs can master now better than any human and defeat all humans. This is a game that requires language and persuasion. And so the AI was able to generate persuasive language with these players and defeat humans in a game of negotiation and uh, persuasion. It seems reasonable to believe that some of these developments could soon start to put large numbers of people out of work. How might states react to that? The age of Earth we just lived through, the 19th and 20th centuries, was something of a golden age for democracy worldwide. But this is a new age, an age of air. And while air is, in some sense, more egalitarian than Earth, which is naturally hierarchical, it does things differently. One possibility is to introduce universal basic income, in which every citizen receives money without having to work. That doesn't feel politically possible right now, but the world is changing fast. And this is where I think it's important to talk about an idea of a so-called dark Aquarian. Are we, as Naval Harari has posited, just hackable interfaces? I mean, he's gone as far as to claim that the human being and the idea of the soul is an antiquated idea that actually is false. And that in fact, we can let computers in through some kind of Neuralink injectable or some kind of interface and then program the human being, just like a computer would be programmed. I mean, that's a wildly Aquarian vision, where remember the sun has its uh, exile in Aquarius. There's a real challenge, I think, over the next period against these technological changes to figure out what it actually is to be human. This whole run of Pluto and Aquarius will be confrontations collectively and interpersonally with notions of what the self even is against the onslaught of technological upgrades. We'll see what's going to happen. That's the kind of excitement for this period is that we get to live through implementation of these new orders of technology and then come out the other side. 
you know, not worse for the wear, and I think maybe better for the wear. We're going to have a more clear sense of how to embody the soul, how to live and uplift the human spirit and use these tools um, as augmentative forces rather than as destructive forces. That's my hopeful vision for Pluto and Aquarius. Now, we also saw how Pluto in Aquarius signified great encounters between peoples, including China and the West. Those meetings blew open perceptions of what was possible. They showed that there were completely different ways of life at the other ends of the world. Now, in today's world, we're more connected than we've ever been before, but we're still divided physically and by language. Imagine what virtual reality or extended reality technology combined with language translation technology could do to change that. Imagine meeting and talking with somebody from a completely different culture. Normally, you wouldn't understand a word each other said, but through this technology, you can talk as if you're speaking the same language. Imagine what that could do to human and global consciousness and to solidarity among people. And there's one really out there possibility that I feel I have to mention, because we could be looking at an even more dramatic expansion of perspective. What if we discover alien life? Now, a lot of efforts are being expended by scientists to this end, so we have the science side, but then we also have the fact that some kind of process of UFO disclosure seems to be taking place right now. Oh my gosh. They're all going against the wind. The wind's 120 knots to the west. The military releasing this 2015 video two years ago showing naval pilots off the coast of California completely stunned. Look at that thing. So bear in mind those Pluto and Aquarius significations, bear in mind what's happening now, and just keep discovery of alien life on your Pluto and Aquarius bingo card. And what about geopolitics? Are we going to see changes to the global order over the next 20 years? So turn to the geopolitical side, we've got these new structures that are emerging, new orders. There's competitions for what countries or groups get to control the kind of Saturnine driver's seat in terms of the global trade and the global collective. There's a lot that might be indicating the emergence of multipolarity, new networks of governance and power and new currencies. This is all part of the Aquarian moment here where groups are trying to find freedom against old structures and new structures that are emerging to try to impose themselves on new groups of people. I've said many times before that I think new forms of state, particularly the network state, are on the way in the age of air. A network state is a state of people distributed around the world but connected using cryptographically secure networks. This is an idea outlined in the book The Network State by the Silicon Valley investor Balaji Srinivasan. But if you have trouble imagining that such a thing is even possible, we only have to turn back to the last age of air a period when we saw the rise of something called the Hanseatic League. This was a decentralized confederation of merchant towns across Northern Europe, a completely different form of societal organization. It shows that states built along decentralized network lines are not only possible, they've happened before. Could we see the first shoots of these kind of states emerging during Pluto's stay in Aquarius? I wouldn't bet against it. Alternatively, is the Hanseatic League showing us something of how a multipolar world might function? Instead of the centralization of power in a single state, could we soon see the beginning of some kind of confederation of states which cooperate on equal terms while having autonomy? One thing to bear in mind is if we look at the natal charts of some very important countries such as China, the United States, Russia, there will be more. The moon is in Aquarius in these charts. The moon in mundane astrology signifies the people. We're going to see large portions of the people represented by those moons impacted by Pluto's transits over those moons in the charts of China, Russia, and the United States. Big chunk of the world population. So this video series was contemplated as a kind of getting out in front of the major shift of this decade, which comes in 2026 in terms of the final pieces all coming into place and this basket that Andre Barbeau was so focused on as a symbol for a new world civilization. I think it's undeniable that the astrology is telling us that we're about to have refreshed energy on a whole number of fronts because many of these major planets, all of them in fact, 
will shift into new signs by 2026. So, you know, as astrologers, the purpose is to try to get out ahead of that. Why we would talk, start talking about it now is so we can trigger in you, trigger in us, the creative faculties that we all have to begin envisioning how we want these symbols to manifest, to begin working with having an interplay with the astrology and using these historical cycles that we've been able to pull from and introduce here as jumping off places for how we might envision a better world. I like the Barbeau vision of a kind of global new world civilization where the technological transformations that are coming uplift people that don't have access to technology or knowledge and haven't had access to it formally and that can be rejuvenated in their lives. You know, Neptune and Aries, new visions for what's possible in terms of the imagination. As these technologies come online, think about the positive creative upsides where we team with AI, we team with those computing powers to make whole new um, nodes of meaning in the religious fields, in the creative fields, film, music, art. These are the exciting opportunities in terms of my view. And I think the other side of it is when we talk about cycles of war, for example, in this series, we've mentioned war a few times, Uranus and Gemini in the US, its history of war, Neptune and Aries with Saturn and wars that Russia has engaged in. To me, that's actually a way to transmute, to see it. We're not taken by surprise, right? And so when the war headlines, if they do come, God willing, they won't, we're prepared. We've prepped psychically. This is the last episode in this series. Thanks to all of you who followed us along this journey. The world is a complex place and so is the astrology that describes it. Synthesizing it all into a single coherent vision of where things are going is almost impossible. You'd need the mind of God to do it successfully. But we hope when people look back on these videos in a few years time, they'll see that we did get quite a lot right, even if we may have missed the mark in some areas. And we really hope we've given you some food for thought and perhaps some inspiration. So before we go, I'd like to thank SJ for working on this project with me. If you haven't already, please do subscribe to his YouTube channel, SJ Anderson, where he's doing great work week in, week out, bearing witness to the unfolding of the times using astrology. Now, both of us are consulting astrologers and we would love to speak to you one-on-one. -on -one. Our contact details are in the description below. And if you're intrigued by the Age of Air, I have a video all about it, which you can watch right now.